Good afternoon, everyone. It's my privilege to welcome all of you to our dialogue. Thank you for joining us. And I wish to express our appreciation to our distinguished guests for the reflections they will share with us. I'd especially like to recognize His Eminence, Cardinal Blaise Supich, for being with us. Cardinal Supich, it's an honor to welcome you back to Georgetown. I'd also like to recognize our colleagues at the Prince Awalid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at our School of Foreign Service, our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, as well as John Borelli and Sam Wagner for their efforts to bring us together. Our gathering focuses on our interreligious commitments. And we have come together to reflect on the example set by Holy Father Pope Francis and by the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Al-Tayeb, and most recently, the Holy Father's visit with Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani in Iraq. There is perhaps no more powerful model in our times of this commitment than the document on human fraternity, a joint declaration of interreligious cooperation signed by Pope Francis and Grand Imam Al-Tayeb two years ago in the city of Abu Dhabi. In their dialogue, their friendship, their engagement with one another, we are reminded of the commitments shared by religious traditions around the world. We are witness to faith as a force for peace, for unity between peoples, as a force for common good. What we saw in Iraq during Pope Francis's visit were these ideals brought to life the embodiment of the conviction that a culture of encounter and dialogue is, in Pope Francis's words, the only way towards peace. Words he offered during a meeting with the Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani in the sacred city of Najaf, among the most sacred places in the world for the Shia Muslim community. In the months since Pope Francis took his apostolic journey to Iraq, our university community has engaged in dialogues focused on placing the extraordinary visit into broader historical and spiritual contexts. Today we have an opportunity to hear our terrific speakers reflect further, enlightening us with their perspectives. Imam Syed Mohammed Bakr Kashmiri is founder Vice Chairman and Religious Affairs Director of the Imam Mahdi Association of Mar Jaiya, a key point of spiritual resources and communication for the Shia Islamic community throughout North America. Imam Mohammed Majid is Executive Director of the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, the Adams Center, one of the largest Muslim community centers in the Washington region. Imam Majid previously served as president of the Islamic Society of North America and is also past chairman of the International Interfaith Peace Corps, organizations focused on providing community-based programming, services, faith, and civic engagement. Reverend George Toma, is core bishop of the Diocese of Eastern United States of the Assyrian Church of the East and rector of St. Andrew Assyrian Church of the East in Glenview, Illinois. The church descends from the oldest Christian community in Iraq and is now present in countries around the world. I wish to again welcome Cardinal Blaise Supich. Cardinal Supich was appointed in 2014 as the Archbishop of Chicago, one of the first appointments made by Pope Francis in the United States. He was appointed to the College of Cardinals in the fall of 2016 and currently serves as co-chair of the National Catholic Muslim Dialogue and Initiative of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Professor Tamar Hassan, Hamid bin Khalifa Al Thani, Professor of the History of Islam 
and director of our Prince Awalid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding will be serving as our moderator of this panel. Professor San, thank you so much for guiding us in this important conversation. I wish to express my deep gratitude to our panel for sharing their insights on today's dialogue and thank everyone once again for joining us. I wish you all my very best. Thank you so much, President DeJoya. And thanks to all of you for joining us today for this important discussion among leaders of Christian and Muslim communities in North America. This is the fourth of Georgetown's programs on the significance of Pope Francis' visit to Iraq and his special meeting with the Shia leader, Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani. On March 15th, right after the visit, Sean Casey of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs interviewed Father Antonio Spadaro, editor-in-chief of the Jesuit periodical La Civiltà Cattolica, and Ricardo Cristiano, uh, an Italian journalist and Vatican expert about the historic dimensions of the journey to Iraq. On March 17th, two days later, I moderated a discussion between one of our participants today, Imam Sayyid Kashmiri and Cardinal Wilton Gregory, Archbishop of Washington, DC, about how this visit can impact Catholic Shia relations. Then on May 6th, Cardinal Michael Fitzgerald, a distinguished expert in Islamic studies and known for his promotion of Christian Muslim understanding, delivered the 2021 Georgetown Lecture on Contemporary Islam, focusing on the visit of Pope Francis to Iraq within the context of the history of Muslim Christian relations. Cindy Wooden, a bureau chief of Catholic News Service responded. Today, we welcome you to our discussion with another distinguished panel focusing on the papal journey and the future of religious pluralism in Iraq in particular, in light of the Catholic leaders' um, ongoing efforts really over the past 60 years to build relationships of trust and cooperation with Muslim leaders, of which Pope Francis's 2021 meeting with Ayatollah Sistani was only the most recent. Pope Paul VI, who established the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue in 1964 and was the first reigning pope to fly on a plane when he visited Jordan in 1964, then proceeded to Israel and Palestine. And in Bethlehem, he was the first pope to address all monotheists inclusively given the context that meant primarily Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Pope John Paul II was the first Pope to visit Egypt in 2000, and he often met with Muslim leaders on his many international travels, including a visit to the Grand Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, where he gave an address in 2001. Pope Benedict offered silent prayer at a mosque in Istanbul in 2006, after meeting with Muslim leaders in Turkey. All these trips are part of the church's broader efforts at establishing interfaith solidarity that really began with the Second Vatican Council in the mid 1960s. These efforts have resulted in a number of documents calling for mutual respect and appreciation most recently, as was mentioned, the Declaration on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together, signed by Pope Francis and the Sunni Grand Imam Sheikh Ahmed al Tayyib in 2019. The church has engaged in specifically Catholic Shia dialogue since the 1990s 
when Cardinal Michael Fitzgerald was secretary and then president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. And he inaugurated a series of discussions with the Iranian Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. Their fifth meeting was in November, uh, November 2005 and produced a joint declaration. Pope Francis's visit uh, to Iraq in March of this year was the first time a Pope had ever visited Iraq and held such a high level meeting with a Shia leader in his home country. And that's what we've gathered to discuss further today. The implications of their courageous encounter for the global community going forward. So let's turn to our distinguished guests. Uh, President DeJoya introduced you all, but I'd like to um, welcome you again and thank you all for being here. Um, let, let's start with our returning guest, Imam Kashmiri, a uh, representative of Ayatollah Sistani in the US, in North America, actually. Uh, Imam Kashmiri, the president of Iraq uh, invited Pope Francis to visit Iraq. It was the president who invited him to visit Iraq. But can you help us understand a little bit about how the invitation for a personal visit with Ayatollah Sistani came about? Well, thank you for having me. It's always an uh, honor and pleasure meeting you and uh, participate with other respected colleagues, distinguished uh, scholars here. And before to answer your question, allow me to um, offer my condolences in the event of 40th of Imam Hussein, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, who these days we commemorate this event and we witness uh, over 16 million visitors these days settled in Kabbalah, Iraq. My condolences to all who those, they, they uh, align and, and support the mission of Imam Hussein, grandson of Prophet against all injustice and for the liberty and freedom. Um, Yes, the invitation came from the uh, president of Iraq, but uh, to answer your uh, question in coordinating the visitation to Najaf, uh, honestly, this is nothing new. Uh, we have a long, long journey uh, between uh, different organizations in Vatican and in Iraq and Egypt. Not only in Iraq and Asia also, we have so many uh, organizations, scholars in uh, Lebanon, Gulf countries, uh, home city, seminary. Uh, we've been always in touch and uh, attending and supporting different uh, initiatives. Uh, so when uh, we saw this opportunity um, is building by the president of Iraq, um, all those groups who've been in touch uh, within decades, not only after 2003, but also since decades, um, this visit prepared and we honored having uh, His Holiness Pope Francis in Najaf. Thank you so much, uh, Imam Kashmiri. And uh, Father George, Core Bishop of, again, the oldest Christian community in Iraq, the Assyrian Church of the East. Uh, can you add any insights about that invitation? Uh, the visit of uh, His Holiness uh, Pope Francis uh, to Iraq in particular, um, uh, to the war city uh, of, Mos uh, of Mosul, Nineveh, it was really uh, significant, very significant. Uh, uh, for us, and uh, and it, it it Pope Francis as a father, as a spiritual father, is recognized by 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 the whole world, and I believe as a father, he 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 went there just to comfort the people 
who have been suffering and persecuted unjustly uh, for a long period of time. He went there uh, to be with them, to cope for them, to give them hope and, and to, uh, to strengthen them uh, in, in, in their own place of uh, residence. And uh, especially, especially the people of, of, of Iraq and in Middle East uh, appreciate that because the time, time table uh, uh, of, of his visit, especially uh, during, when, when they were threatened, threatened of two, two important things, two major things. One is the, the terrorists. Uh, and the second was uh, a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Pope Francis, out of his love for people, to be with the suffered people, he went there uh, and he put life actually, his life in risk, in risk, uh, but uh, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't not do that because of his love. And he knew that his visit to Iraq uh, in, in particular, where it was the place, uh, the home of the birth of the ancient Christianity, and and uh, uh, it's it's a fact in since 2003, the number of Christianity uh, of Christians in in Iraq began significantly to decline because of 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 ISIS because of uh, of the U.S. Uh, military intervention, uh, all these things. So it's the place where, if you ask me, for us, it's the place where our church was born. Our church is still the, the sea, patriarchal sea. It's like uh, Vatican, Rome for the Catholics, uh, uh, Seleucia, Tessifon, Baghdad is for us. I just came from Iraq last week. We elected a patriarch. And unfortunately, he was a bishop of California, Mar Awa. He, he, he was elected patriarch. He's going back there to, to, uh, to, to Iraq and to his sea to fill his empty sea. And, and the other uh, significance of the visit is if you look at Iraq with the coexistence of three uh, 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 major religions, uh, Islam, uh, 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 Jew, uh, Jewish religion, uh, Christianity. We we have a long history of coexistence together, and and I, I believe if 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 we don't make a, 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 a say a real change, uh, the Christianity will not survive there. So the visit of Pope Francis to Iraq and meeting with Ayatollah Sistani, I, I believe uh, gave a big message, not just to Christians, but to Muslims as well, that we are, we are close together. We, are, we have to respect one another regardless to our differences. Uh, we have to, to respect uh, each other's differences. We have human values. Uh, we cannot exist by uh, hating one another, killing each other, uh, persecuting one another. So the Ayatollah Sistani is a very important source for Shia. And Pope is uh, the same for, for Christianity and especially for Catholic Church. I believe one foot, one fatwa, one fatwa from Ayatollah Sistani can make a big change. And that that and I hope that that fatwa will be for the continuation of coexistence in peace and love and and and, and respect. So it, it's very very important. Religious people, what are they teaching? What are they saying? Are they preaching a love, respect, living peacefully with one another, destroying the walls of division, or they are preaching? Uh, uh, pre hatred, a killing, persecution, nudges, and things like that. So to me, it's very important. It was very important, and I already can see the difference.
Thank you so much, Father George, and thank you for reminding us about the appointment of um, the Patriarch Marawa in Baghdad. Um, uh, very, very exciting, very wonderful news. And also, um, I should add, thank you, Imam Kashmiri, for reminding us of uh, the commemoration of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, such an important symbol of just what we've all been talking about and what Father um, George just mentioned, the need to struggle in community for justice in the face of oppression. So thank you both for that reminder. Um, Your Eminence Cardinal Subic of Chicago, what did you find most impressive about this meeting? I really enjoyed listening to the others uh, speak because it was informative to me from their perspective. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, panel today. Uh, I think it's important as already was noted that uh, the visit between the two took place uh, in the context of the Holy Father uh, coming to Iraq to really fulfill the aspiration and the desire uh, all the way back to John Paul II who wanted to go to Iraq. And for one reason or another, these were, this, the, this visit was never realized. And even in this moment of, uh, of the pandemic and the security issues that were raised, the Holy Father decided he still needed to go. Uh, it was a way for him to say to the world, we need to take the risk of dialogue. We need to take the risk of being together in a moment in which there is so much that can separate us. So I think that that context is very important. And of course, uh, to have the Ayatollah uh, welcome him in, in such a very, I would say personal way, in, in a very simple way, uh, without a lot of fanfare, in a very modest home, in a very modest setting, uh, said to the world that these two could see each other as brothers, as, as having much in common. And I think that it sent a message to, uh, to our communities. First of all, that here, if the Holy Father can travel so many miles in an area where there are security issues with regard to health or whatever, should we be able to cross our neighborhoods and our cities to go and encounter people of different faiths. And the second is, uh, this doesn't have to be a great fanfare. This can be a normal kind of relationship that we have, much like the normalcy of the modest setting of that meeting, where two brothers came together and uh, wanted to encounter each other. I, I think that for me, that is, that is an important message. Unfortunately, I didn't see that the media covered this very well uh, with any kind of, um, I, I would say, uh, prominence. Uh, there were other things that were on the news in those days, uh, but this was an historic moment uh, for people of goodwill. And, and I just, uh, I, I'm so glad it's an opportunity like this panel to, to bring that out and, and talk, uh, talk about it because the, the two of them and their humility and coming together told all of us something about what we should be doing. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. And yes, um, we will talk a little bit about the media coverage. But first, I'd like to take that same question to Imam Majid of the Al Dallas Area Muslim Society. Um, Imam Majid, what did you find most striking about this meeting? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you. And thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, I just want to say that uh, the American Muslims and the Catholic Americans have, have great relationship. For 30 years, we have dialogue here. If a visit like this will really support this effort of continued dialogue and the support that American Muslims get from the Catholic community is tremendous, especially in difficult times. I, don't, I just want to say that first. And, and I would like to say I had the privilege uh, to meet the, uh, His Holiness, uh, the Pope in his residence, uh, just before the visit to Iraq. And we were Sunni and Shia together visiting him with Jewish and Christians, something called Abrahamic Initiative. And, uh, the, uh, and I had the privilege to visit Ayatollah Sistani 
in his home. Uh, I'd like to say that, uh, just I'd like to uh, uh, confirm and, and to say that uh, what the Cardinal have said, humility. The humility come from those two giants, um, you know, religious leaders, that they are really uh, setting a model and example for others. And I think the um, His Holiness, the Pope, uh, have really in his um, teaching and sharing with us the importance of religious freedom, uh, the importance of justice, dialogue, and all of this aspect of human uh, fraternity uh, document, I think meeting someone like Ayatollah Sistani have sent a big message as everyone have said that this um, dialogue take place with both Shia and Sunni. The influential Sunni leader, uh, Imam uh, Tayyip from, uh, from Egypt and Ayatollah Sistani who have great influence in the Shia uh, community. I just want to say that um, we, as people of faith, we have to find this commonality to work together to improve human uh, conditions. And both those great leaders have encouraged, invited their grassroots, the, the, their followers, to engage in sincere uh, dialogue and work together in the neighborhood and to create a community and society of compassion, of uh, solidarity, uh, and the community that really serve humanity. Therefore, I would like just to say that um, it's a very significant visit, especially in, uh, at the time that where Christians in Iraq, uh, be, because of ISIS and others, uh, terrorist attack had a difficult time. And I would like to say that uh, Ayatollah Sistani always spoke against terrorism, against extremism. And I think it was a very significant, significant visit. Thank you so much, Imam Majid, and um, your your mention about our work in the neighborhoods is so important, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But before that, I want to go back to the point that um, Cardinal Supic made um, about media coverage. The meeting between Ayatollah Sistani and uh, Pope Francis was private, of course. Um, and as Cardinal Subic noted, there really was relatively little media coverage globally about it, but we have had some media reports about their discussion. Um, a statement issued by the Marja'iya of, of Najaf, um, the religious establishment surrounding um, Ayatollah Sistani said, um, during the meeting, and I'm quoting, during the meeting, the discussion revolved around the great challenges facing humanity, the role of faith in Almighty God, God's messages, and the high moral values needed to live up to those messages. The Holy See then issued its own statement saying that the Holy Father stressed the importance of cooperation and friendship among religious communities for contributing through cultivation of mutual respect and dialogue to the good of Iraq, the region, and the entire human family. Um, I'd like to ask Imam Kashmiri, can you give us your insights into the overall contents of the discussion? Sure. We are facing uh, huge challenges in the world, everywhere. It is not only in Iraq. Iraq is one place and maybe one manifestation we can find out there, but worldly, on world level, we are facing many problems, many issues, uh, challenges. And we see time from time to time wars in different corners of the world. I think, let me say, I understand from think, this thinking of two holinesses, Gandhi Ayatollah Sistani and uh, uh, Holiness uh, Francis, uh, Pope Francis, when they insist on cooperation and working together, being aligned together against all these challenges, 
it comes from a significant issues that we have to maintain. Religious leaders, specifically at this level of leadership, when they meet, they give a strong message to everyone, not only Muslims and uh, Christian, not only Shia or Catholic. They give message to everyone that it is the time we have to cooperate, we have to respect each other, we have to put our weight to stop war. The message was from this discussion with this very humble and, and fraternity we, we saw in Najaf, it sent a strong message that enough is enough. We have to stop war wherever it be. And following this message, those who have the power and they have influence in different regions, in different, let's say, on international community level, we have the power. Religious leaders, they have still, they have the powers, the, uh, they have the power to make some influence on political leaders to bring the peace again to this war. War, we have to stop it in, on, on any type of levels. In Iraq, Sayyid Sistani, with, with all his directions, uh, instructions, um, efforts, he, were, he was able to stop sectarian violence. He was able to welcome uh, those who displaced from their towns, specifically our uh, sisters and brothers, uh, Christian sisters and brothers. We welcome them in our houses and still the brotherhood and, and uh, respect between these two groups, it is not only just for respect, it is beyond that. Just recently I said, we are commemorating the 40th of Imam Hussein. Do you know amongst those millions of visitors, we witness groups, not only individuals, groups of Christians, AZDs, and from different uh, 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 religions, they participate and they give respect to Imam Hussein. This gives us a strong message. This also put religious scholars in a a uh, higher level of leadership to not only cooperate, but also make some influence on religious uh, political leaders worldwide to keep mankind in a safe place, in peace, and keep them away of any type of war. This is the uh, minimum what we can uh, talk and explain about this type of messages we received from to holinesses. Otherwise, it takes really, it, it needs not only one session, one webinar, maybe it needs some, some books to, to be written about it. This is really a historical and momentum uh, meeting that still we need to understand it. We need to uh, explain and, and uh, talk about the outcome of this meeting and keep uh, going talking about it. Uh, you mentioned about media. Yes, uh, there is an issue with media. Uh, his uh, uh, Cardinal uh, uh, QC, I think, uh, mentioned about media. Yes, there is about, uh, something about media. But I think uh, important centers like Brinkley Centers, your initiatives and others, still we can keep this uh, historical meeting um, as a, a momentum and keep it uh, alive with bringing media again and talk about it. Really, we need the peace. We need not only cooperation, we need beyond that, that. we need collaboration. Allow me to add this. Uh, I think it, I made it long, longer, but uh, allow me to add this important thing as well. Uh, maybe it doesn't need to uh, ask religious scholars or uh, his eminence, Gand Ayatollah Sistani or Francis, uh, to, to give fatwa. Because this type of cooperation, this type of understanding each other, uh, dialogue, these are our principles. 
we don't need to give fatwa. Fatwa comes in some circumstances and, and solving some temporary issues. Uh, but when we have a belief, and this belief established on these principles, we need to work on it more and more and give tangible examples to people and open it, work on it consistently and bring media to it so we can, uh, we can expand it to the uh, mankind everywhere and practice it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Imam Kashmiri, and your, your insights into the focus on uh, war and the opposition of both these great leaders to war is of critical importance and helps us understand that the conflicts that we have seen and that uh, Father Toma, uh, Father George mentioned specifically, the source of those conflicts, the source of the war is not from religion, it's not from religious leaders, and that's what we need to focus on. We need to recognize our solidarity as human beings in the face of standing, as Imam Hussein did, against oppression, standing together against the sources of oppression. Uh, Father George, um, the same question to you. Can you share your insights into what Pope Francis and Ayatollah Sistani discussed at this historic meeting? Yes. Um. Yes, uh, uh, one thing I, I believe that they did their part. Ayatollah Sistani and Pope Francis, they did their part. Now it's our part. We, we, have, we have to uh, transform into action what they did, what the, the message they sent it to us. Uh, we should not just use these things for, uh, for example, for religious marketing or for academic uh, lessons and teaching and things like that. But simply we have to transfer that into action. As Jesus says, uh, the one, not those who say, but those who do. So it's our role as, uh, as uh, religious leaders to work on these things in our communities. To, to deliver these messages to, to grassroots level people. But if we don't do that, actually we'll stay with where it is. But I have been in dialogue where, in the dialogue committee with the Catholic Church since uh, uh, for 26 years. And I have always, we, we signed many documents, important documents, but I always have said them these documents, we, the committee, the commission, uh, the uh, Pontifical Council for Pro Promoting Christian Unity, they know about, we know, we are aware. What about the people? There are still people who did not hear about these things. So it's our, our obligation is to take it to our uh, communities to do uh, uh, deliver elective lectures, uh, invite each other there so we'll be closer to each other, inform them about, about the, their meeting. And, and, and this way we will, we will tell the people that, you know, the, 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 the meeting and, and the importance of their meeting, uh, we are embracing and we are implementing in our, our parishes and in our community. Otherwise it will be part of the history a part of the history, and we should not do that for marketing and other things. Exactly, thank you, Father George. Uh, exactly, very much part of the inspiration that we need to take from this meeting. Um, and now a question for both Cardinal Supic and Imam Majid. Can you tell us from your perspectives what is being said about the meeting among your respective communities? Is it having resonance among your respective communities, specifically in North America? Uh, Cardinal Supic? Uh, well, I think that uh, it's given me an op a platform uh, for me to address uh, issues of prejudice, uh, religious prejudice, sometimes uh, we have in our own uh, Catholic community about people of different faiths and remind them 
uh, of the core values that were expressed by the Second Vatican Council uh, and, uh, and how we, ecumenism and relationships with other faiths uh, is something that we should uh, invest in and never be afraid of. Um, I think also uh, here in Chicago, uh, and the Imam was right, we've had a really a wonderful partnership and dialogue. I, I have to tell you though, that a couple of years ago, the last time we met, one of the things that I heard from the uh, Muslims leaders was um, the fears that they were having, the people were having about their children being um, ostracized or uh, bullied at times because of their faith to the point that uh, they were afraid that uh, the reaction of young people could be radicalized uh, and that they would, they would not feel at home in this country, much like I think happened in places in Europe. So uh, religious leaders have a, a particular responsibility to step forward because religions uh, can, can have their extremist. They can, religions can be manipulated by people. And that's why I think it was so important for what the Holy Father and the Ayatollah did to show that leaders should step forward. It was a message, not just for people, but especially for religious leaders. This is how we should take the initiative to make sure that we don't allow the voice of extremists to come forward and dominate the discussion, that we speak out whenever there's prejudice against people of different faiths, that we see each other as brothers and sisters in the human family. Um, and so the, the visit of, of the, the two leaders gave me a new opportunity, a platform to address those kinds of questions. But um, while it's true that um, they modeled for the world that we should be together, I think they said something to us as leaders. We have to step up whenever we see uh, a person of a different faith different than our own in Christianity or Catholicism being bullied because of their religion um, or feeling as left to feel that they don't belong in society. Um, that has to stop. And we have to think about what our responsibility is to our children. And, and that is something that I take very seriously. And that's why I welcome this visit. It gave me a new opportunity to do address those kinds of questions. Excellent. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, and and uh, Imam Majid, um, same question. Can you tell us from your perspective, how is this visit being received or perceived in your communities in the United, in the United States? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, in America, we have started a process of interfaith, RA, which is the Muslims leaders from Shia and Sunni community get together with the collaboration with uh, Imam Sayyid Kashmiri actually, and his uh, organizations, we brought the leaders together to engage in dialogue in America, because we know this tension also, uh, you know, sectarian tension happening along the world. But I do believe this, this visit, it will give um, more momentum to the work that's been done in America, interfaith work, especially with, with the Muslim, the Catholic community. Uh, and it's one thing to say to communities, please work together. Another thing to show it in a modern example, having the, the head of the, the, the Catholic church, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, Pope Francis himself, go and visit uh, Ayatollah Sistani Negev. That set an example and model. In American Muslim community, well, we have uh, leadership um, meetings uh, many times, and we'll continue uh, to work on that between the, the Shia and the Sunni community. And I think the visit uh, and the, 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 uh, the document of human fraternity and the visit of uh, Ayatollah Sistani uh, really give um, the community, both communities, uh, more momentum to work and to talk about those documents, about those visits, as a, a, a way of guiding our dialogue and understanding, because it's not just a visit. They talked about how to address the issue that concern both community, the issue concern humanity, the issue of peace, uh, women empowerment, uh, talk about youth, uh, uh, addressing the issue of violence, issue of citizenship. Those are values 
uh, very important principles that people of faith have to work together in making sure that in every community, those values have been protected, been promoted, uh, been shared, uh, and, and the, the, the outcome of it, hopefully harmonious, uh, compassionate community. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, and I'd like to now um, see if I can draw out a little bit more um, of Father George and uh, Imam Kashmiri on the question of, um, of how this historic meeting in, impacts the future of um, intercommunal relations in Iraq specifically. Um, we've just talked about in the US and North America, in Iraq specifically, um, Father George, how do you see the meeting? Do you see it having impact um, in Iraq? Yeah, the impact is is the the, the what is the reason for our people to leave their homeland? The reason was persecution, suffering. So once there's at at, at this present time, uh, uh, and especially immediately after the meeting between uh, Holy Father and Ayatollah Sistani. So we can, we can experience that there is kind of peace. It's much better than before. So that's why we don't hear about people uh, leaving or applying for immigration. Actually, it's, it's sometimes it's happening the opposite. The people from here, as I said, our, our, our patriarch is born of America and he was Bishop of California is going back to Iraq. Many people from other countries going. So when they experience peace, they, they don't leave their country and be immigrant, immigrants in a, in a new countries, everything strange to them, language, everything, you know? Uh, so that, that's the outcome that I can see it immediately right now, that I hope that will stay, that people are living peacefully, with one another, regardless to their ethnicity, uh, their religion, or uh, their uh, background. Thank you, Father George, and um, and Imam Kashmiri. The same question. Uh, yes, uh, let me uh, talk about it a little bit deep in Iraq. Then I will say something about here as well. Uh, see, in Iraq. Uh, before all these issues happened after 20, uh, 2003, uh, the relationship between all Iraqis, irrespective of their religions or uh, sects, they are really just like one family, brothers and sisters. They love each other. They have not only commonalities in Islam and Christianity, but also we have so many commonalities in culture in culture and people, they live just like one family, as I said. Unfortunately, when violence came into Iraq after 2003, we witnessed these issues, uh, something that were weird. We never seen it in Iraq. And uh, specifically after ISIS, when ISIS attacked the northwest uh, of Iraq and specifically in Mosul and around, where Sinjar, when uh, those areas that our Christians, they, they live there, easy these uh, minorities, they live there. Um, sometimes I don't like to use this, um, uh, this word, minority. Um, anyhow, our, our brothers and sisters in different faith, they live there. Unfortunately, they face this type of challenges and they start to leave Iraq to different countries. I think, uh, with the fatwa of Say Sistani against uh, ISIS that pushed people to stand all united against ISIS and they kicked them out and they uh, uh, celebrate Iraq from them. Uh, do you know those who really fighted ISIS not only were Shia or Muslims, but also we had Christians. We had Christians. They all together, been as a one hand, one family, 
one power against ISIS. So I think with the uh, all these all those efforts uh, reached to the point that uh, get blessed by this holy meeting in Najaf by Gandhi Ayatollah Sistani and uh, Holiness uh, Francis, uh, Pope Francis. Uh, this gave a strong message, not only for peace, but also for future of Iraq. You are asking about the future. Uh, as uh, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Father George mentioned, uh, the peace since this visit till now, we are significantly see there is big um, uh, uh, implementation, big change and uh, moving forward, we see more peace in Iraq and so many Christians, uh, if, if they didn't leave Iraq, at least they forgot about uh, to, to immigrate out of Iraq. They start to rebuild and, and work on how, how to come back to their town and start their life again in, in their uh, homeland. But this needs a lot of work. Uh, number one, as uh, Cardinal uh, Sufic mentioned, uh, if I'm not wrong, or Imam Majid, um, this needs a little bit work from religious scholars as well. Or exactly as uh, Father George mentioned, uh, he said they did their part, then now we have to do our part. This is exactly in previous webinar, uh, I mentioned this, that um, the ball right now is in our court. Religious scholars everywhere, not only in Iraq, everywhere. We have to find out some plan for long-term uh, plan and work on it. It is not only just meeting here and there or doing webinar here and there. Um, this is good, not bad, but we have to find out some uh, long-term, not only short-term, long-term plan to invest in this visit. Let me say this very openly, and please don't get me wrong. Since the Prophet Muhammad, till now, we hadn't such a great meeting between highest religious leaders in the world. The, the relationship sometimes was up and down, sometimes wasn't uh, available, uh, situation wasn't held uh, to, to have such meeting. Since Prophet Muhammad, he welcomed uh, an important delegation from Najan, from Christians in Najan. Till now, we hadn't have such a great uh, opportunity to meet at this level. So we have to invest in it. This is number one. Number two, to keep the future of Iraq with the mosaic of the uh, uh, people from different uh, background and different uh, religions, uh, this needs a lot of support from Iraqi government and also the international uh, community. Those uh, people who displaced, right now they want to come back to their cities, to their towns, they have nothing to, to live with. So just asking them, or they get a spiritual message from holinesses that you have to keep your citizen and work on your citizen and, and uh, back to your town, that is not enough. That will not be implemented without full support from Iraqi government and the international community. Keeping this mosaic in Iraq is highly important. I'm saying this, I'm stating this officially. We in Najaf, we as a religious authority in Najaf, we believe strongly that Iraq must keep the diversity of people and we don't give, we shouldn't give any opportunity to our enemies to keep Iraq or to filter Iraq with one religion or with, with one uh, school of thought. Thank you so much, Imam Kashmiri. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm going to skip some of our prepared questions in the interest of time because I want to make sure that our audience have uh, time to ask their questions. But before we open it up to the audience, I would like to ask um, some related questions about just the implications of what you've just said. 
um, for all of you, what do you think are um, could be the long-term effects of this meeting? Specifically, I mean at the grassroots level. Sometimes the effects of these high-level meetings stay at the high level. Actually, <laughs> the, the government of Iraq has recently issued a stamp commemorating this wonderful visit beautiful picture, the same picture that we used in the promotion for this, uh, for today's event. But, but taking it beyond those high levels, what proposals might you have that will allow the good effects of these meetings to reach the grassroots level? What can we do in our own communities to carry forward the spirit of those meetings um, especially as we emerge from the um, isolation imposed by the pandemic, and a number of you have mentioned that. What special steps can we take to, to bring interfaith uh, cooperation and solidarity, the kind of solidarity, not just on theological issues, not just on religious issues, not that I mean that those are limited, but specifically solidarity uh, in the face of the injustices caused by war, environmental degradation, marginalization. How can we work in our everyday lives to um, promote the, the solidarity shown by their holiness's visit? And I, I'd like each of you to address that question, um, if you will, uh, beginning with your eminence, Cardinal Supic. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd say, first of all, we need to uh, reopen our uh, contacts and dialogues that we've had at this point, uh, and, and also exchanges by our communities that we've had here in Chicago. I really have uh, enjoyed those. Uh, whenever <coughs> I go to a, a, an IFTAR, I, I, I go with uh, a, a number of people uh, young people and, and people of different ages so that we can have that kind of experience. So I think that kind of grassroots contact is important. But I, I have to tell you, I'm really taken with the uh, wonderful um, uh, intervention just heard from Imam uh, Kashmiri in terms of that word he used, we have to invest in what that visit meant. Um, and I think that that is, uh, that is something that uh, we should take to heart. Um, could it not be that uh, we could call on our uh, universities like Georgetown and others that, that have already a footprint in this area of dialogue to be the means by which we would be convened uh, to uh, strategize about some ways in which uh, we can allow this investment to take place. I could see, for instance, that our National Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, could step forward in a way that is, uh, uh, makes this a, a high priority as we uh, move forward with our own agenda uh, to see what we can do. Um, and I think that's important in this country. And, and I, I want to speak in a way that does not politicize this moment. But there is the reality that the, uh, in terms of the mindset of people in this country, because of the war that was inflicted on Iraq by the United States government years ago, that um, uh, Iraq, Iraqi people in some way are different than us, that we, 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 uh, there's maybe an antipathy towards, towards Iraqi people. Um, and, and that has to change. Um, uh, the, the, when John Paul II sent his emissary to the president of the United States at that time, he told him that a number of things would happen if you went to war. You would go in, you would not know how to get out. There would be many deaths on all sides. There would be civil unrest uh, for a long period of time and religious minorities would be persecuted. All of that happened. And so it seems to me that we in the United States especially the religious leaders of the United States, have a duty now to help repair the damage that was done by that war uh, and also the wounds that were opened as a result of that war. 
so I would hope maybe that uh, the uh, the educational uh, framework in this country, especially that we have such wonderful places like Georgetown and other centers where there is dialogue, could maybe be the convener to bring religious leaders together of different faiths to strategize about how we invest in going forward. Because I think uh, Imam Kashmiri's suggestion and his word invest I think was very powerful and something that we should not uh, lose sight of. Excellent. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. Uh, Imam Majid, same question. Uh, first of all, I agree with uh, Imam Said Kashmiri and uh, His Eminence the Cardinal of the idea of uh, taking this to the next level. I know that the human fraternity, they created a higher commission. And, and to try to operate, uh, to bring this to uh, grassroots level. But I think the visit of Iraq uh, with the uh, Ayatollah Sistani, with the, um, His Holiness Pope, uh, the, the Pope uh, Francis, has to be operationalized, meaning that you have to have uh, programs on the ground. Uh, change happened uh, when really others of you know, members of community take sense of ownership of such initiative. And I do believe that maybe Georgetown could be that place. <laughs> you really can think about what that means to long-term uh, that uh, what Imam Said Kashmiri have suggested earlier. I would just want to say that um, one of the most important aspects of change, I think, by involving women and, and young people, youth, in taking this to, to that the grassroots levels, uh, I think that we have to look to uh, the different segments of community and society in both communities and how can we bring about change uh, in, in that regard. I just want to say that there's, a, there's a, a lot of healing needed. The visit is the beginning of that, but there's a healing that needs to take place in the many levels. Uh, all, of, all of the things happened in social fabric in Iraq, for example. The tension happened uh, between the East and the West you know, regarding all the wars that we have. I think that healing process begins with rebuilding trust. And rebuilding trust uh, now have started with the highest level, but have trickled down to the grassroots levels. And that required people to get to know one another. And, you know, it's not just meeting in the high level, but that should take place in grassroots, which is bringing to the neighborhood, Christians, Muslims, Shia, Sunni, they have to create a kind of an opportunity and a safe space for rebuilding the trust so that we can even work on the various initiative of the, of the visit. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I'm beginning to see uh, patterns here, of, uh, a vocabulary emerging from this meeting. Um, invest, we need to invest in the message and in our communities. We need to operationalize, and I imagine you just used that. There needs to be healing and a rebuilding of trust. Those are such key concepts. Let me ask uh, Father George the same question. How do we invest, operationalize, begin that process of healing and rebuilding trust in our communities, in our neighborhoods, where we are today? Well, first of all, uh, I will say uh, the, the world has changed a lot. In the past, we could say, you know, there was a kind of line between East and West. And, and in the East, there were mostly uh, the other religions are, are, are residing, are living. The West were uh, like uh, Christians. Today is not like that. Today, everywhere you go is East and West. There are Christians, there are Muslims, there are Jewish everywhere in the whole world. So this, this topic, this subject is not related to one region, uh, but it's related to the whole world. And I can see uh, three things that, three uh, steps that are or responsibilities or roles. First of all is the role of the clergy. What is our role here to bring that change about or uh, to make uh, that meeting uh, 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 alive and that meeting to to really uh, uh, bring change and 
in in the world, in our life, in human beings, right? And that depends on our role as clergy. What are we articulating? What are we instructing people Sundays, Fridays, and Saturdays? Are we instructing them love, unity, respect, human values that are like uh, uh, people are unique and repeatable, precious, these kind of things, or, or we are teaching something totally different from the message of God. Number two is the role of uh, uh, education, curriculums. What is our curriculum? So first of all, in seminaries, in mosque schools, in, in, uh, in uh, synagogues, then we come to, to in, in, in other public schools. What are we teaching people? Are we teaching people that, that we are all human beings created by God, image and likes of God? We have to respect and love each other or, or, or we are teaching something totally different. Number three is sort of the role of politicians. What are the politicians are thinking? For example, if you take the, the, the politicians in Iraq until recently, they were not thinking about Iraq and the people of Iraq, citizens of Iraq. They were the thinking about their own uh, sect, their own party, their own followers. They were ignoring the rest of the people. If you were not part of one of their groups, you were totally grown. You were poor or you were killed or you were persecuted. So the role of politicians should be really that their intention should be the whole Iraq, the whole uh, citizens of people, serve all of them in love regardless to their ethnicity, religion, color, or, or whether they are in the, in, in the southern part of Iraq, in middle part of Iraq, in north of the part of, part of Iraq, they are all people, Iraqi people, and I have to serve them whether they are my parties or not my parties. The, the other thing is that we have to do, as the Imam said, the, taking the, uh, the, the, the ownership. This thing is not something that is just for Muslims or for Jewish or for Christian. It's for all of us. Then we are all responsible to do something about it, to benefit from it, to grab it with both our hands and apply it and, and make it to be fruitful for our own benefits. How can we do that? So you cannot do that if you don't have a vision. See the vision that if we live together in peace and harmony, this is how the world, the world will look. Will look that everybody loves each other. There's no fear, there's no hatred. I can be out anywhere I want, you know? So your what is your vision? of coexistence together, Muslims, Christians, and Jewish. Jewish. That's, when you have that vision, then you will take risk. Some, because as, a, as a, the Imam said, there's still fear. There's still trust to be rebelled. Uh, if I don't trust somebody, I cannot walk with him at night, I have to look behind, I have to be careful. So we have to reveal, rebuild our trust so we can, speak, we can uh, uh, so, uh, take that risk. Uh, and also, once we do that, we have to make decision. I have to make a decision that this is the right thing to do and I have to do it regardless. So these are the things that we have to work on them. And I believe if we, Take this path, the path that Pope uh, took and, and Imam Al-Sistani took, which is, I believe, this is the path they took. If we take this path and they give us these messages, I these are I extracted, I extracted from 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 their meeting, for example. Uh, so we will be in a better shape. Thank you so much, Father George. And you added another. Um... Another term that I think is important in the vocabulary that's coming out of this meeting, taking ownership, individual ownership that is um, added to um, investing in the meeting, operationalizing, healing, rebuilding trust. Thank you all so much. 
Before we turn to the audience, Imam Kashmiri, do you have a final word or should we go straight to the audience? Yes, if, my, if I may. Um, I agree 100% with all that we heard from uh, our respected uh, and distinguished guest speakers. I would love to add, uh, I think we have to start from two things. Number one, we uh, understand each other's something that related to us. And number two, we have to recognize the threat that comes from outside. So regarding the first point, uh, I noticed this. Um, maybe it is not good to talk about it openly, but uh, this is my way. Always I am open. Uh, there are some religious scholars who are not open, who are restricted, who are limited, and uh, maybe they don't want to, to collaborate and cooperate with others. My message to all religious scholars, irrespective of religions, I know some Muslim, some uh, Christian, they are not too open. They might don't like to open discussions or uh, visiting each other or doing some interfaith. Uh, I have to give them a message that we need to trust in ourselves. We are not weak. I'm talking about all of us, Muslim and Christian and others. Everybody is strong. Everybody has his own understanding. That's fine. We have to build it from here. We belong to God. We are belonging to God. This is the main identity we carry on. Based on that, if I be in this uh, land or that land, in this country or that country, my main responsibility is to keep my citizen, I work on my citizen, and I work on my religious identity. If we establish it on this, then there's no differences between anyone. We will have the trust. We will build the trust based on these two. Now, you belong to God and you see it from this aspect. I see it from this aspect. It's okay. Everybody has different understanding. Who said we have one understanding? Even one family sometimes through uh, in, in one religion, they have different understanding and that's why we have different school of thoughts. So we have to pass this. This is not big deal. This is not big challenge. We have to go out of it. And uh, as I said earlier, if we want to invest in this holy meeting that took place in Najaf, let's start. Let's start with family visitation. Let's start with making field trips for our children to different uh, place of worships in respect of the uh, religions. So when, when we educate our new generation on this type of understanding, on this type of relationship, I think we can build the trust again and make it stronger. The outside, uh, what I said, the threat that comes from outside, uh, maybe this needs a lot of discussion, but uh, very brief, shortly, um, we as a as faithful communities in the world, we are facing a big challenge and big threats against our family system and our faith. Today, the extreme liberalism, really, I consider it a big threat. I'm, I'm not against those who they have different understanding or they have um, they don't believe in, in God or they don't believe in religions or they think <laughs> religions are dying, that's okay for them. Let them be happy with it. But I, as a religious person, I, as a faithful person, I see with the uh, moving forward, the uh, ideas that comes from extreme liberal people against religions, against family system, against establishing uh, natural families, uh, human families, that is a big threat. That needs, 
as, as India, we said, the ball in our court. Yes, it is in our court. We energy scholars, we need to sit down and talk and make some long-term project, not only short-term, to solve these issues, to stand against uh, atheism that really affects our communities and our families. I know this is sensitive. I know this is not enough to bring it in one sentence or two sentences, but just I brought it up to invest in this holy meeting that really gave us and, and inspired us uh, to work again and to move forward strongly by the grace of God. Inshallah, thank you so much, uh, M.M. Kashmiri. Um, really focus on the, the family as the core of values, the, the, the incubator of values that must, uh, must be there in order to influence all our societies. Thank you so much for that intervention. And, and now we have just about 10 minutes left to take questions from the audience. Um, and they have been vetted for me. So I'm going to start, they've been numbered. Um, and Imam Kashmiri, you are um, again <laughs> on the spot. Uh, Imam Kashmiri said that he would, um, he wouldn't expect Ayatollah Sistani to, to issue a fatwa. Um, uh, as Father, Father George had asked, um, calling for coexistence. And the questioner asked, but wouldn't such a fatwa help? Uh, I meant with that, we have principles. When we have principles, um, what is the need for fatwa? We have principles of believing in God. The, the jurist, what does it mean if he gives fatwa all people, you have to believe in God, doesn't work. We have principle of, uh, of building uh, a friendship between people. This is a principle in Islam. This is mentioned in the Holy Quran. We have principle of how to dialogue with others. And God says in the Holy Quran that I created people from differences uh, and, and they have different languages, different colors, different diverse people. So you have your job is to coexist, to know each other and to coexist. What does it mean? If a jurist comes here and, and a, ju a jurist, a faqih, knowledge of certainty, come here, comes here and say, I give fatwa to people to coexist. So when God says that, it doesn't mean I, I have to repeat it. I have to work on it. Fatwa specifically amongst the uh, Shia school of thought, really, it is, it is powerful. And because it is powerful, uh, part of why it is powerful, because it comes from the right people on the right time and the right subject. If Marja, a faqih, a jurist, gives fatwa every day and for any topic, then the value of the fatwa will be gone. Yes, exactly. That makes perfect sense because a fatwa is to address a new question, really, a contextualized question. Um, as you say, the Quran covers very clearly the equality of all human beings and the need to learn from one another and compete with one another. It actually says compete with one another in good works. Um, a second question. Thank you, Imam Kashmiri. A second question. We'll give you a rest for a moment. and. Uh, maybe I'll address this to uh, Cardinal Supic. The question comes from um, distinguished professor, Dr. Abdulaziz Sashidina. Uh, why is it that religious leaders have not been able to generate interfaith conversation and tolerance in realistic terms? So by which it, it seems he means to formulate an inclusive theology that still awaits to be, uh, to be written uh, again, asking in the form of a fatwa, but let's, you've just carefully covered the question of fatwa. But what about this notion of inclusive theology? Can I ask uh, His Eminence Cardinal Supic to address that first? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, in, in many ways, I'll pick up what uh, Imam Kashmiri said about the fact that we also have principles with regard to 
the uh, ways in which we engage people of different faith with great respect, beginning with the renewal that took place to the Second Vatican Council. Uh, my concern is that we've not, we've not uh, taken those principles and acted on them. Uh, and so I think you, we can have all sorts of nice documents and words, but it's really up to us. But I also think that one of the reasons there's uh, hesitancy uh, for, I think there are two things that are operative right now. I think first of all, uh, is that uh, as, as we've heard today, many of the major religions are under great pressure uh, because of the forces in society today that weigh against uh, people of faith. And so uh, that can create in, in our own mentality and our own approach, a kind of circling of the wagons where we're self-protective or we're self-referential as Pope uh, Francis has said, the church sometimes becomes. And so we're occupied with our own concerns rather than engaging others outside of ourselves. And I think that that's really a temptation we have to overcome. Uh, we cannot be so uh, self-referential that we forget the need to, to include others uh, who are different than ourselves. Uh, but I, I think uh, another, another is, is because um, too often we allow uh, the political divisions and polarizations in society to invade our own life as well, um, to the point where many of our people, uh, whatever their religion, uh, swim in the in the waters of, of political reality, and um, uh, in in many ways are influenced by that. And so it really takes on our part as religious leaders an extra effort to have people examine how is it that these influences rather of, of, of polarization in society uh, need to be moderated by what we really believe. How does our faith inform us? Because our faith, uh, from our perspective in the Catholic tradition, is that we, are, we, we don't have antipathy towards people of different faiths. We see people as our brothers and sisters, especially in the, in the Abrahamic uh, religions huh, of uh, Christians, uh, Jews, and Muslims. Where And this was the reason, in fact, John Paul II wanted to go to Ur of Chaldea because he wanted to see this as an opportunity to recapture that unity and why Pope Francis went uh, to pick up on that. So uh, I, I think that we, we just have to, as leaders, make sure that we do not allow the forces of politics to invade our attitudes in our church. But also, we should, we should not hesitate to engage others simply because we're preoccupied with just keeping things going and to the point where we become self-referential. Thank you so much, Your Eminence, and, and excellent points. Um, we are running out of time. I'm going to conflate um, some of the questions into a final question uh, for any of you who would like to comment on, on, it's in the same theme of the solidarity that we're struggling to establish in our communities, we see we have theological solidarity, core monotheistic issues, core um, value issues shared in solidarity. Our question has been, our theme has been, how do we operationalize them? How do we own them, invest our, uh, in them, in ourselves and in our communities? So one of the questioners um, brings up a very, very practical issue on which we could all uh, focus rather than focus on difference, focus on shared concern for, as was expressed on September 7th when His Holiness Pope Francis um, and the ecumenical patriarch uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury signed a joint statement on climate change. Um, the questioner asks, what are the prospects of a similar statement by our guests among those faiths um, uh, on solidarity, and I'm going to twist the question a little bit on solidarity, specifically um, interfaith solidarity in our communities to struggle for climate change, uh, against climate change, I should say, and the impacts of it on all of us. Because as we know, some of those impacts, um, the, the most vulnerable among us are most impacted by them, and the marginalization 
caused by those impacts often feeds into communal hostility. So I'm going to just toss that to uh, any of you who would like to address that. What about solidarity on the issue of uh, climate change, environmental stewardship? I would like us to, uh, to thank you all, all of you for uh, allowing me to uh, be part of this amazing discussions. Uh, when we talk about human fraternity, humanity have a place to live in which is called the earth. Uh, when you talk about the solidarity of humanity working together as brothers and sisters, we have to also to protect the home that hosts all of this inhabitants. And I do believe that uh, I'm amazed by uh, the, you know, his holiness, um, you know, teaching in the issue of environment. And I think uh, it really have set a model and example for religious leaders around the world to take this issue very seriously. Because we're talking about the issue of stewardship. And I think that if people find a commonality to work on something that could be a threat to human existence is the environment. It's one of the things I'm very passionate about. And I do believe that if uh, all the documents, the theology that we teach of solidarity goes around environment will have saved everybody on earth, including atheists who don't, who don't believe in God, you know, because that was this uh, values are about to protect human dignity, human honor, and to protect human life. You know, one of the most important thing in Islamic theology is the protection of human life. By the way, in the issue of, the, of, of inclusive uh, theology, I think vocabulary is very important. The issue of stewardship, that every religion believe in stewardship and protecting you know, uh, uh, the environment protecting um, the rights of everyone to live dignified life. I, I do believe that it is very important for us in order to operationalize it and to bring this to, uh, to progress with levels, to begin with something that's so obvious, in my opinion, like protecting the environment. Therefore, I think that's one of the things that we can really work together to take that document of His Holiness to say, now, let us see how we can apply that across the board. Exactly, thank you, and find common ground. Uh, Father George, would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I agree with all of them as, um, as the Imam say, it's the matter of, again, ownership. We, this world belongs to us, and we own it, and we have to take care of it. For the sake of who? For the sake of mankind to be living uh, again a healthy life, a healthy life. That's 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 very important. Uh, and if we have to relate that uh, uh, the uh, climate change uh, uh, issue to to what we were discussing uh, uh, related to to living together, uh, we all. Uh, a monotheistic uh, religions is the same. It's the same, almost the same thing. We have to 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 look after the uh, environment, the place we are we are living uh, in it uh, to be a healthy place, healthy environment. Uh, uh, as as the world should be healthy for us, then the religious environment should be healthy for for us also to to. To be to live uh, together uh, peacefully, I, I believe that's that's very important. And again, we will not be able to 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 do that unless we we take we have the sense of uh, ownership and take the stewardship of that upon our shoulders and 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 work on it. Excellent, thank you. Showing the broad ramifications of this quest for, for intercommunal solidarity. Final word to Imam Kashmiri. Uh, Excuse me, if you ask someone else, I have some noise issues here. I will get back to you. Okay, thank you. And we just have one minute left. Um, final word to His Eminence, Cardinal Supic. 
Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you again for bringing us together. Uh, these kinds of even if they're virtual uh, are great opportunities for sharing and I hope it was helpful to the audience just to pick up on uh, what the Holy Father has done in Laudato Si that encyclical was uh, addressed not to Catholics or just to Christians but to the whole world because he sees this as a human issue and uh, if we can rally around that then maybe we can find other points of common interest that is going to bring about a better world for all of us. Uh, we're all sons and daughters of God, uh, and we all uh, need to, as um, the, both the Ayatollah and the Pope said in the statements that were released, uh, realize that our faith uh, should uh, contribute to the good of society, and we have responsibility as leaders to do that. Thank you so much, and thank um, all of you for being here. Thanks especially to our distinguished guests for sharing their insights and hopefully inspiring us to embrace the spirit of these interfaith efforts and work toward communal solidarity in our shared struggles to establish justice in our communities based on shared values of human equality, dignity, and our shared stewardship of the earth. Thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to see you again.